Hello, and welcome back to our series on weapons and repair. In this video, we'll be covering the EPE. We'll be talking about the basic inspection, maintenance, and repair of EPEs, along with how they work. But before we do that, let's talk about basic parts of the weapon. All weapons consist of the point, the blade, the guard, the grip, and the pommel nut. My last job in the Army was as director of aviation programs and foils, epes, and sabers are like helicopters. The helicopters have what's called a Jesus nut and that is the nut that holds the rotors on top of the helicopter. If you lose that then you've got problems. Pommel nut is basically the same thing. It is what holds the entire weapon together. They come in various styles. You have what's called the outside hex, the inside hex, and the slotted. For French grips, you have a large pommel nut that goes on the end. These are connected with either a crescent wrench or if you have an old spark plug wrench that will fit over the top and it will help tighten that. Each one of these particular pommel nuts have a different tool. An Allen wrench, which is a six millimeter Allen wrench, an eight millimeter socket wrench, or a large flat tip screwdriver. Each one has its advantages and disadvantages. The outside hex fits down inside the grip very nicely. The issue is, is that sometimes that it can become jammed up against the side of the grip. With the inside hex, the issue becomes now is if your tang has been cut too long, as you screw it in, it can back the Allen wrench out to a point where you cannot unloosen it. The flat tip screwdriver is, works very well, except that if you put too much torque on it, you can end up spreading this out. And again, it has the same issue with the tang length as the inside hex in that it can, as you tighten it down, it can back this out to the point where you can't unscrew it. What's important is, is that whatever grip or whatever pommel nut you decide on, make sure that all of your weapons have the same ones. That way you only need to bring one tool to strip. Now that we've gone over the basic parts of the weapon, we're going to talk about putting it together. So I have here the various parts to put together. I have a blade that, when you look at it, this one is bent according to the rules. It has one long continuous bend in it. The issue is, is that if this comes in and has an S bend, that's not a good thing. The reason being and the reason why blades have a bend in it because it acts as a shock absorber. When you hit your opponent, it should bend up and away from your opponent because if the blade breaks, then the force behind it will tend to take it up and away from your opponent as opposed to going into your opponent. If you have blades that tend to bend this way, when it bends down when you hit, it's very dangerous because when, if it breaks, then that broken portion will go towards your opponent. Same thing applies as if you have a S bend. If you have this, you put a double stress on your blade. You want to take those out. This particular blade has an excess of bend in it. For an epee, it should have a one centimeter clearance. And the way you measure that is you put it on a table with the tip down, and when this is assembled with the guard up against, and you take a one centimeter block, and it should not pass underneath the blade. There are several ways to take the excess blade or any kinks out of, a, out of the blade. And the way you do that is that you can either run it under your foot, or my preferred method is to take a crescent wrench. 
you take the open end of the crescent wrench and you put it over the blade and you find the area that you want to get bend it out and you squeeze between the two and you slowly work any of the kinks in the excess bend out of it. One of the issues with epes is that sometimes the tip will get bent very sharply. That's illegal. The rule states that it must be one continuous bend all the way down. Again, the crescent wrench is good for taking that excess bend out. This particular blade now has too much of a bend here, so I will fix that. And again, you want to place the contact point of the crescent wrench at this point where you want to do it. And you just slowly work it away until you get a nice, smooth bend. Put it on your table, and the block does not go underneath it. So this, le this blade is now legal. Now let's get started putting this together. Take your blade, put it in the vise, tip down. Most pre-wired blades come with tape around the wires and also come with what's called spaghetti cord or spaghetti wire installed over top of it. The spaghetti wire is an insulator that protects the blades as they go inside of the, the guard. It also prevents cheating. It should be pointed out that the vast majority of rules in EPE are not safety related. They are generally prevent cheating. And EPE is probably the root cause of a lot of the, those particular rules. As we discuss later on about how EPEs work, you'll find this, uh, find out why we, we say this. Uh, and the reason why you have the covering on the wires is to prevent them from, from crossing or being manipulated so that they can cross and indicate a touch. Next, you want to put on the guard. Now, before you put on the guard, I have an example here of one that needs uh, some repair work. As you can see, it's got some fairly large dents in them. What you're looking for is if, whether or not you have a dent that is large enough that could catch a point. If it catches a point, then it can cause excess force to go forward and cause the blade to break and go back to the situation that we talked about before. So, in order to repair these, you can take this and your vise and a small ball peen hammer and slowly work those out. Now, sometimes if you just have a point area, use the back side of the ball peen to take out these area these dents. As I said, some of these are pretty Pretty shallow, but we'll go ahead and take some of them out anyway. The other thing that you want to make sure is that these rivets that hold on the reinforcing plate are tight. You can reset those very easily by the same way of just making sure that you can pound them in there. If you have some that are particularly uh, hard to get to, you can take an extension from a uh, socket set, put the flat end in, and then very carefully tap and get those dents out too. Okay? So, that's basically how you repair a guard. So, as I said before, you take your wires, you put them on, For this particular one, you run the wires through. Now, there are some cutouts that are on the inside of these. When you put this together, and I'm going to put this together for a right-handed, you want to make sure that the large portion of the guard is towards the outside of the hand. Make sure as you put it over the, over the blade that the wires fit inside those little grooves. Okay? Next thing you do is you take the connector and you slip the connector over the wires and onto the blade. 
Be sure that you put the connectors on before the bell pads. If you put the bell pad on first and then put the connector on, then you defeat the grounding of the weapon. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about the function. You get those in, in position. Now, there are two ways to install the connector for an EPE. You can either connect it to the fat side or to the inside. It makes no difference as far as the rules are concerned as to which side you put it in. Some fencers take it to the outside and they have to cross their hand to put in the plug, but it keeps it away from their thumb and gives them greater action with their fingers. The club that I work at, most fencers like it on the, on the outside, so that's where I tend to put them. You put the connector in, hold down the wires, put in the bell pad, put the guard on, or correction the grip. The next two things are a lock washer and the pommel nut. The lock washer, you only want one of these. What it does is it provides tension between the grip and the pommel nut to keep the pommel nut from backing out. If you put too many in there, you put more than one, you can't compress them enough to get the spring action of the lock washer. If you want to extend the pommel out, then you use flat washers. A technique that I use to put on the lock washer to prevent it from sliding down and not going over the tang is you put it over a, a, a screwdriver, put the tip of the screwdriver on the end of the tang, and then just let it slide down. Then you put the pommel nut on. Tighten it down, making sure that you don't crimp the wires between the grip and the guard. If you do that, you cut them, and then we're into the rewiring section, which, was, which will be another video. All right, tighten that down. Now, you're ready to connect the wires. One of the number one issues with wires that I see when they come to me is that the covering of varnish that's on the wire and the, co and the cotton wrapping is not removed entirely. Uh, they put varnish on them to prevent moisture from getting in and corroding the wires. Unfortunately, it's an insulator, and if you put together a weapon and it doesn't work, one of the things you need to do is check to make sure you got the varnish off. The way I remove the varnish is with the lighter and you just burn it off. Once you do that, scrape off the carbon. And then one way you can do that is just kind of drag it between your thumb and the edge of your guard. Now, routing the wires to the outside. And I will say that within uh, the U.S. that the wires are routed to the outside. There's a small hole here called a mouse hole where the wires can't come up and then go and it helps protect them. Uh, the current inter interpretation of the routing of these wires is that they must be outside so that you can't hide a switch or in them. Next thing you need is a pair of hemostats. If you've been to the emergency room as many times as I have, you probably have several of these as they tend to let you take them with you if they've used them for um, anything, any procedures like uh, sutures or whatnot. Clip that on the wire. You wrap it around the socket, between the socket and the washer. Now, when you do this, make sure that you wrap the wire in the direction that you're going to tighten the socket. If you don't, you end up backing the wire out. The next thing you're going to need, and this is a special tool that I've made. You ever wonder what to do with those little short stubby screwdrivers that come in every uh, screwdriver set? This is one thing you can do. This is done for both foil and epee, and the center piece here is three millimeters wide, which fits inside the thin socket of a, of a foil socket. This will also work within the four millimeter sockets for epees. You put it, slide it in the middle, and you just tighten down, and it keeps the screwdriver from sliding out all over the place. It keeps it in place. You connect both wires.
Now the other thing that you want to make sure is that when you connect the wires, you want to make sure that they are connected to the A and the B sides of the socket. And you now have an assembled weapon. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to test this weapon. Make sure that all the connections are tight, everything's in place. I've got my test box set on Epe. You can also use one of these small LED light boxes to test it. Plug it in with the Epe body cord. And nothing should happen. Depress the tip. and you should get the movement on the needle and that means that it's good. Next thing you want to do is take a 750 gram test weight plus or minus three grams, place it over the tip, depress it, release it, and the needle should go over and then come back and it should be done smoothly. Okay. This one is not that smooth. It's not coming back and it's not registering. So we're going to have to get into the tip here in a second to, uh, to change out some of the springs. The next thing you do is you want to take a shim. Now, there are two shims that are associated with, with an Epe. There's a 1.5 millimeter shim which must fit between the tip and the barrel smoothly. The next is a 0.5 millimeter shim. The 0.5 is the minimum distance it must travel before it lights. If you push it down and you don't get a light, the needle doesn't move or you don't get a light, then it's good. The issue you have is that the tolerance on most shims that you find in tournaments is 0 0.05 plus or minus on 0.5, which means you can go as low as 0.45 or as high as 0.55. A dear friend of mine now who is now gone, Joe Burns, has took a set of shim material, 0 0.07 inches, which is 0.432 millimeters, which means that if it passes this shim, then it will pass any shim that is out there that is within tolerance. The other thing that you want to do is you want to depress the tip and bend the blade back and forth. What should happen is the light, the needle should stay in one place. It should not move. If it does, that means you have an intermittent break in the wire. And again, we're back to the rewiring section that we talked about earlier. Okay, so we've determined that we have a problem in the tip, so we're going to have to take it apart. Two main things that you're going to need are a roll of tape, and for those of you that eat a lot of pizza and probably have many of these, a kitchen magnet. Mine just so happens to have my business card on the other side, because this is a tool that I give away to most armorers as their very first tool. The reason why is because most of the things in fencing associated with weapons are round, and round things like to roll. So you place the weapon guard over or on the, uh, the tape, and then you place the magnet underneath the tip. The next thing you'll need is a jeweler's screwdriver. What I have attached to it is called a buckyball. It's a rare earth magnet uh, that was a toy that unfortunately is no longer uh, available because of health reasons for small children. But if you can get a rare earth magnet or whatnot, go ahead and attach it to your screw. What that does is that it captures all the uh, little piece parts on it and holds them in place while you're taking them apart. The Epe has two screws in the tip and they're round and threaded on one end and unthreaded on the end that has the slot on it. Generally they are all, there is no difference between them. Uh, the only difference is is that Leon Paul uh, Fencing Supply makes a tip that has a much finer thread on it and finer I mean by closer tolerance that if you put one in will tend to re-thread 
or expand the threads of the tip and hold in much longer. The problem is, is that if you take them out, if you put in another tip, tip screw, they won't hold as well and they'll fall out. So we've got the tip out. Next thing we do is remove the spring, which we've determined is not good. So we will take it and throw it away and we'll get a new one. This little toolbox that I have here that holds all my parts, you can get at a hobby store in their beading section. Uh, this one I think cost me about four or five dollars. It has 12 little uh, cases in there. You can put all your parts in and it holds them very nicely. So, we will get our, our new pressure spring. Your magnet is also good for picking those up. Now, sometimes they will come and they'll get tangled together. It's relatively easy to take them apart, just twist them apart. Now, you want to put your spring in. Before you start putting it together totally, what you, one of the other things that you want to test is to make sure that if you have a problem with your travel on your spring, you can put it in, have it tested to your box, and go ahead and put in your shim and see if it, if it goes uh, like or the needle moves. If the needle moves, what you can do is take the contact spring, which is the little spring on the end of the tip, and you can adjust it problem is they only adjust one direction and that is in. You can't back them out if you go too far. If you do then you have to pull it out completely and get a new spring. To start the spring on there you put it over the threaded end of the tip and you screw it on. Now, when you screw it on, a full turn generally will, will shorten it by almost a millimeter. So what you want to do is be very careful, and I do this by either twisting it at a quarter of a turn or a full half of a turn. And the way you measure that is using the two screws holes on it. If you're looking directly at it and you turn it up and you can't see them anymore, that's about a quarter of a turn. If you turn it around to the other one comes in, that's an eighth of a turn or a half of a turn. So what you do is then you put it in, you test it. Okay, if it doesn't go, then I turn about a quarter or or a half. It depends where you are in the in the process. And you can generally figure out how close you're, you're getting as you, as you work your way in. And you work it in to the point where you, have just, where you don't have any uh, contact at all. Once you get to that point, then you put the tip together. And this is the trickiest part. You want to take your screw, put it on the end of your screwdriver, and generally what I do is I'll take my middle finger and I will hold the screw in place while I put it together. Turn the weapon so that you're facing up. And insert the screw. Now, once you get it aligned, one of the things that I do is I twist it backwards, which seems counterintuitive. But what you, you can feel, and this was pointed out in a trick that was shown to me by Mr. Dan DeShane, was that you can feel the ends of the threads click and engage. Um, it's a very small one, but you can feel it. And then once you get that done, you just tighten this down, holding it in place. Once you have it in place, again, test your shim to make sure that you're still within tolerance. You turn it over. and put in the next screw. Now this can be very very tricky again if you don't hold it in place properly and align them. A 
because the, sometimes the screw will want to turn on your flip on you or the polarity, the magnetism is wrong and it will want to flip up and do all kinds of, if, and especially if you're in a hurry, it's going to do this. Um, and what was normally a quick t I, task turns into a lengthy one and you as an armorer end up increasing the stress level of your fencer, which is not a good thing. So, so knowing that, recently someone has invented a new type of screw called the new Epe Point screw or NEPS. It's a very clever design in that it is threaded on both ends. It has a hole through the middle and then slots on either end. It has a special little tool that when you pick up the screw, it holds it into alignment. Has the, has the slots that engage. And then when you go to put it in, it doesn't want to go anywhere because you've got positive control over the screw the whole way in. It has a small collar on it that prevents you from over tightening the screw and cutting through the insulation and shorting it out. A great little tip. So now that we have both screws in place, we've got our travel uh, adjusted and we got it. We now have a working weapon. Okay, now we're going to talk about how the EPE works. The EPE, as we showed before, has a contact spring in the tip. The EPE is what we call a normally open circuit, much like the light switch in your house. When it's open, no electricity flows. When it closes, the electricity flows back to the score box and lights up the target light saying that you've made a valid touch. The one connection that is made that is not to the weapon is to the ground. And as we talked about in assembling, we wanted to make sure that the connector was in contact with the blade and the guard and the C line of the connector, which is the ground. Electricity is sort of like water. It wants to flow from the highest point down to the lowest point. As long as it's flowing down to the lowest point, it doesn't particularly care. In this case, if you have the circuit is going from the machine down to a ground, then nothing is going to happen. When you touch your opponent's weapon and it doesn't go off, what, it do, what is happening is, is that it is seeing the ground from the opponent's weapon and nothing happens on the box. If you touch your opponent's weapon and the light goes off, that means there's a grounding problem on the opponent's weapon. It's either corrosion on the guard or on the blade or there's a loose connection. The third issue you may have if you find that you can't see a grounding spot on your opponent's weapon is that you may have some kind of corrosion or covering on the end of your tip. So take a sanding block or a piece of sandpaper occasionally and sand that off to get the corrosion off of that. One of the issues that you have, as we showed together or previously about wiring is, is that sometimes you'll put this on a machine and you know the wires are connected and you push it down and nothing happens on the machine. The problem that you have is that somewhere within the system you have a short between one of the wires to the ground. On this particular machine I have two settings, one for foil saber which connects the B and the C the B line to the ground or A to C short that you can test to see if one of the wires are grounded to the weapon itself. If that happens or you find that the issue you have is you don't know which wire is the one that's grounded. Therefore you need to take it down and go to the rewire section that we're going to shoot later on. So that covers the basic inspection, maintenance and repair of the EPEs. Thank you for listening, and please visit my website at thearmorerstore.com. Thank you.